Welcome again to Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice, and my guest today is Newfoundland novelist Wayne Johnston. Uh, he's written several novels that are set in Newfoundland, uh, including the, uh, the very successful Colony of Unrequited Dreams, but his most recent book is a memoir of sorts called Baltimore's Mansion. Welcome to the show. Thanks. In, in that recent book, uh, Baltimore's Mansion, the uh, first image in the book is of a legendary iceberg. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could describe that for us. Um, it's, it's what in our family was called the Virgin Berg. Um, it's an iceberg that in 1905 came drifting down the um, south coast, or the southern shore actually, which is um, just south of St. John's, in the shape of the Blessed Virgin Mary. At least those people who saw it uh, saw in it the shape of the Blessed Virgin Mary, several hundred feet high. And um, as it was going by, um, Catholics sort of went uh, crazy because this was uh, the feast day of St. John the Baptist and um, they headed out in fishing boats with priests and nuns aboard, uh, some just to follow it, others hoping to get close enough to actually get some ice from it. They picked up bergy bits and growlers from the, from the back of it and um, used uh, that ice as um, holy water in uh, sacraments for right. years afterwards. It was quite a spectacle, apparently. I've seen a photograph of it. It doesn't look to me as much like the Virgin Burg as it apparently did to them, but... Uh, Is that some kind of um, you know, community psychology thing going on there where, where one person says, look, I see this, and then other people want to see it, and so it progresses like uh, that? Um, yeah, it, it, there, I think there was an element of mass hysteria mm -hmm. in it. Um, but, you know, I have seen the photograph. The, the part of the iceberg that actually looms highest above the water does have the look of uh, a statue with folded garments and uh, a pedestal, but uh, attached to it is another whole iceberg, and you know that sort of uh, ruins ruins the view. But um, in our family and in many uh, Catholic families, it was something of a you know a mythical a mythical berg. Its actual name. Uh, was um, Our Lady of the Fjords, uh, but in our family. Uh, That's pretty classy. Call it the Virgin Berg. Yeah. Are you a fan of icebergs? Um, you know, when I lived in Newfoundland, uh, the last thing we ever wanted to see was an iceberg. Oh, because, hi. Why? Well, if an iceberg on our side of the island uh, came anywhere near shore. What are the, this is south of St. John's. Yeah, this would be yeah. the southeast part the of the Atlantic side. Land. Yeah. yeah. Um, when an iceberg came anywhere near, the wind would change and it would blow on shore. The fog would come in. And, and if the iceberg hung around all summer, as they sometimes did, the temperature in the summer would be several degrees, at least, cooler than it would have been otherwise. So whenever my mm. father saw one, uh, it was usually, you know, the sighting of one was always followed by a series of, you know, curses and imprecations and all sorts of things. It, it was, you know, we, we, after you'd seen a few, you'd seen enough. And um, also for fishermen, um, they usually ruined the summer fishery. They kept the water so cold that the capelin didn't come ashore. Of course. And when the capelin stayed away, the cod stayed away. So Newfoundlanders are not as enamored of them as visitors are. You know, they, they look great. But, you know, when you have to live with them for months on end, it's a different thing. Interesting. So, yeah, you're not helping the Newfoundland tourist industry right now. Hey, the, no truth the truth is the truth. Isn't this somewhat dangerous territory, writing about family, writing about your father and your father's father? Um, well, I, I suppose to some extent, um, you know, last year I wrote about the small woods. I figure if I could survive that, that family. That too sounds like dangerous territory. Yeah, yeah. So, so that kind of emboldened me to write about, um, you know, closer to home. Uh, actually, when I was about four-fifths of the way through Baltimore's mansion, my father called me. He, he didn't know I was uh, writing about uh, his family. He called me, and as he often does, he says, um, I have uh, a book. You know, I have an idea for a book that you should write. And usually his ideas are about, you know, the imminent invasion of aliens or, or whatever. 
in this case, he said, why don't you write a book about me and my father? And I said, you know, I, I'm almost finished that book. And wow. it was one of those weird sort of things. And uh, So there was family approval? Yeah, it was almost, uh, I think I've almost been commissioned to write it by my father, except in, in, in retrospect. Um, I've spoken to them about it. Um, I've told them everything that's in it. And um, I think they're actually more tickled than anything else. My, my father has always uh, claimed to be the funniest character in any one of my books. And he goes around telling people that. So um, I, I, think, I think I'm okay. Was your family as interesting and as eccentric as those families that are in your fiction? Because you've got a lot of really interesting, funny, yeah. weird characters in your novels. <laughs> yeah, they, my family was um, not as well off as the Ryans of the Divine Ryans, but um, at least as eccentric. Um, you know, my father's middle name is Reginald, and so uh, this was an unconscious thing on my part, but he assumes from that that he's Uncle Reginald. And he has a, for those who aren't familiar with it, Uncle Reginald is an undertaker who was kind of the family renegade and uh, who was always punning and, uh, you know, making uh, puns at uh, the expense of other members of the family. And, you know, my, my father was like that with words, and, and uh, although, you know, not uh, well educated in the modern sense. He was quite well read. And, uh, you know, so um, I do draw upon that sort of um, uh, family eccentricity uh, for my books. And it's good, rich territory, but, you know, those of us who didn't grow up in Newfoundland families, we kind of think, well, this isn't fair. You've, you've got it all there. It's all in front of you, right? Well, uh, that, that works for the first book. Uh, you know, everyone's first book is usually, you know, kind of a transcription of um, adolescence or growing up or whatever, and maybe for the second book. But eventually you have to just use your family, or I do anyway, as a kind of template and uh, ring variations on it that um, either come right, right out of your head or uh, are composites of people, you know, that you know. You do have to move beyond family at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with Baltimore's Mansion, one of the reasons uh, I know now that I wrote it was to find out why father figures played such a large part uh, in my novels. Because Is that what other people were telling you when they read your books, or were you well aware of it? Well, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, in, in the story of Bobby O'Malley, it's kind of up in the air whether or not Ted O'Malley, Bobby's father, committed suicide. In Divine Rhines, uh, there's no question that um, Donald Ryan committed suicide. And I've had a kind of small cult following of men whose fathers have committed suicide because they assume this happened to mm. me as well. That sounds like a difficult group to have it, for It's Yeah, the they're, they're, not, you know, the, they're not the life of the party all the time. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, um, that, 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 you know, that kind of thing... Um, that kind of thing has happened, yeah. Hmm. In, in the memoir, wh what does that title come from, by the way, Baltimore's Mansion? Um, Baltimore is the Lord Baltimore who founded the colony at Ferryland, in, uh, which is 40 miles south of St. John's on the Avalon Peninsula in 1626. Then did he go south to found Maryland or yeah, something? Yeah, he only lasted one place? winter, and I, you know, oh, I, I, I sympathize with him. Uh, yeah. He only lasted one winter in Ferryland and then uh, got a patent of land in uh, what is now Maryland. Uh, but he actually died before he, uh, he got to the colony. So um, Baltimore, Maryland is named after his son. Um, oh, okay. But there, uh, there, you know, there was a long line after that of Baltimore's uh, in Maryland. When you're writing about the, the generations of men, fathers and sons in Newfoundland, it seems that for each generation there's a, a lost Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. Something was there and then it disappears yeah. and it's either just gone or you move away from it or something. Maybe you could speak a bit about this, this sense of loss. Um, well, in, in the Colony of Unrequited Dreams, um, Smallwood says at some point that, um, I think it's, yeah, Smallwood says that the animating myth of Newfoundlanders is... Um, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the king who is always in exile while some pretender holds the throne. And I think even before, before Confederation, even before the lapse of nationhood, if you don't want to call it the loss of nationhood, uh, there was always this sense that Newfoundland 
um, Newfoundlanders felt that they could have been more than they were and should have been more than they were. I think they felt a kind of obligation to be a New World Ireland and, and couldn't do that. And then they felt an obligation to be or do something as great or uh, as, as commensurate uh, with the greatness of the land itself. It's, you, know, you have this magnificent country, and I think this is true of Canada in general. You have this physically magnificent country that uh, imposes on the people who live there an obligation to do something as great as the land. But in the case of Newfoundland, there's, uh, the resources are just not there. So you constantly have this, this um, battle between uh, the beauty of the place and the uh, impoverishment of the people. And so there is always this sense of, uh, of, of yearning, ruefulness, of, uh, and of loss. So people carry this around in their personality. It's, it's not like they're sitting around and explaining that to themselves. I know why I feel this way because of the history I, I, you I speak don't think of. most people know. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and this is just my take, but I think it's right. I don't think most people articulate it, um, but I think, uh, I think it's the case. I mean, I think uh, Newfoundland is, um, you know, a, n a nation that came within, you know, a fraction of an inch of real nationhood, but it's still a nation of the spirit. And even people who voted in 1948 for Confederation uh, felt that. And that's one of the reasons the referendum in 1948 was as um, animated and, and as volatile as it was. Uh, the half that voted for Newfoundland voted from their hearts and the other half felt in their hearts uh, a love of Newfoundland, the country, but, but took, and again I don't blame them, uh, a pragmatic choice to, um, you know, to join Canada so that, that their kids would be better off financially. Did Newfoundlanders do the wrong thing by Going uh, for confederation, like you say, it was pretty close. The vote. It was incredibly close. The margin mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, seven thousand votes, and which means a, a swing of thirty-five hundred the other way would have been, uh, you know, a completely different history for Newfoundland. Although probably the referendum would have uh, come up again, as it does keep coming up in Quebec, yes. until the so-called right answer is gotten. Um, I don't know if if they did. It's hard to it's hard to tell. Um, I do know that most of the Newfoundlanders whom you ask will say that if they had been around in 1948 and didn't know what would happen if they joined Canada, uh, if you ask them now, they would say they would have voted for um, a, you know, independ an independent Newfoundland. Mm. Yeah. Do you carry a, a kind of a grudge? No. Um, I, 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 Newfoundland for me, the Newfoundland, uh, you know, the um, the country that might have been but never was is um, a myth that I find to be a very powerful one that I can use in my work, but um, I don't uh, think about it in, in, in terms of, you know, I wish something else uh, yeah. had happened because I don't think there's any going back. And so it's just, um, for me, it's, a, um, it's, it's, a, it's the foundation of uh, a lot of my books, but in my personal life, I don't, I don't, I try not to think about it really. Right. Yeah. Okay, you don't carry it around. Uh, my guest today is Wayne Johnston, and we're talking about Newfoundland. We're talking about the literature of Newfoundland and his books, and we're going to take a short break and come right back to it after this. And welcome back to Off the Page. My guest today is Wayne Johnston. Uh, we're looking at his memoir called Baltimore's Mansion. And in there, uh, you write about the community of Fairyland. Mm -hmm. um, that's on the Avalon Peninsula, right? Yep. yep. Uh, now, I, I get the impression from what you've written there that not everyone is in love with this big, beautiful sea. In fact, no. they build their houses facing the road instead of the ocean. Well, you know, the, my father and his family were... Um, and, you know, and his forefathers, dating back to 1846, were and thought of themselves as blacksmiths more than they did as fishermen. Um, but you know, to to 
but they, they also fished. But to have a kind of, it's not even a love-hate relationship with the sea, it's more of a, you know, it's, it's more just plain uh, hate, really. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, some, it's something that you can never come to terms with. Um, you can never know, like you can know the land, you know, no, no place on the sea is ever the same two days in a row. Uh, people die in it, it's not user-friendly. Um, but isn't it the sustainer, the provider of, of well, fish, it used to of be. sustenance? It, it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't anymore. And, but for a, lot, for a certain generation of Newfoundlanders, it represented a, uh, or an option that, you know, something they wanted to get away from. If you were going to leave, you had to find a way of making a living that didn't involve the sea. And I mean, Smallwood's whole legacy after Confederation in 1949 was about getting Newfoundland uh, involved in industries that had nothing to do with the ocean, because Smallwood himself had a um, an almost uh, compulsive dislike um, of the ocean, um, and you know my father himself, growing up in Fairyland, felt that way. Every time he went to sea, he would get seasick uh, just once, and that would be it. He would be fine for the day, but you know, getting seasick once a day, every day for your entire life. Um, you know, the, the appeal of that wears off after a while. And um, so he, you know, he, he wanted to get away. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people did. But the paradox or, you know, the contradiction is that having gotten away, uh, they then found themselves, uh, pun intended, fish out of water. And um, as a lot of people do who get away from something they think they don't like, uh, start yearning for it later well, in life. What, ab what about yourself? I mean, you are one of these writers in exile of sorts. Yeah, you, you're yeah. living in Toronto, uh, middle of the continent. Uh, I know there's a lake there, but you're you, you never see it. Pretty darn far from the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a bit of a landlubber, to tell you the truth. Um, I've had some, uh, you know, what what real um, ocean goers would consider pretty minor uh, mishaps on the ocean, but they've left an indelible mark on me. Just crossing the ferry from uh, Newfoundland to the mainland uh, is, a, is a nightmare for me. Uh, you know, the 16-hour ride from Argentia to, to North Sydney seems to me like a voyage around the world. Um, I've never, you know, I've always looked on the ocean um, from Newfoundland as, because I wasn't a fisherman, as this gigantic life excluding tract that separated us from elsewhere. At the same time, I, I feel this um, you know, powerful uh, attraction to it um, that, I, that I can't quite understand. And, and the tension between the two things uh, comes out in my books a lot. And it came out in Colony of Unrequited Dreams in Smallwood's personality. One of the reasons I wrote that book was because when I read about Smallwood, I discovered an enormous number of similarities between him and me. And I found it a lot easier than a, a lot of people think to write from his point of view. And he, he was not a, an ocean goer. You know, when he could avoid it, he did. Was he a religious person at all? No, no. The I real don't. Joey Smollett was no, not. No, he, he was not. Um, what about the, the character in your novel, who is obviously a different person? Is there um, maybe not so much religious in a structured, orderly, organized religion sort of way, but is there, there a soul to him that has a, you know, a spiritual quality? Um, as, you know, Smallwood had a very, um, he, he had a great tolerance for people who were religious because his mother uh, converted when he was in his teens. She, she was born an Anglican but was, you know, not a practicing uh, churchgoer. And then she became a Pentecostal and was baptized in the ice cold waters of Mundy Pond and then uh, became quite devout actually. But he didn't um, and never did join an organized uh, religion. I think for Smallwood, uh, the, you know, his soul, his notion of heaven was a Newfoundland that in which everything was perfect and over which he would preside forever. I, I, in my re research of him and my writing about him, I, I never did come upon a sense that this is someone inclined to ask questions about the nature of the universe or of himself uh, in relation to the universe or 
Uh, he, he seemed to be indifferent in a way that he was quite at peace with about the question of um, a God or an afterlife or, um, you know, uh, punishment for sins, things like that. Mm. Um, he, he seemed so, uh, you know, he was so single-mindedly obsessed with politics, I guess, that it just didn't come up for him. And that, that obsession, I suppose, makes for a good character uh, and in some ways a rich and fun character to develop in a novel. Mm -hmm. In your father's community, Fairyland, though, uh, the religion there, Catholicism, mm -hmm. well, how would you describe the brand of that Catholicism? We're talking about a place where people are seeing, uh, looking for signs, I guess, like the iceberg yeah. that floats by. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the, there is actually in Newfoundland um, pockets here and there something called, and there is elsewhere, something called charismatic Catholicism. Um, on, in Fairyland, this was not charismatic Catholicism per se. It wasn't a revivalist kind of Catholicism. But they were quite um, fervently Catholic and, and regular church goers. But there's also, in, was in Fairyland and maybe still is, a sense that uh, religion and politics were inextricably mixed and would always go um, hand in hand. And it was, it was really, you know, a way of defining yourself uh, in the world. Uh, there always seems to need to be an us and a them. And on um, the southern shore, the us was Catholic and uh, independent. And the them in Fairyland in 1976, I think, the census showed 695 Catholics and one I can only presume to be brave Protestant. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the, there, there is the sense of an us and a them and I think that's how people define themselves on the shore, the southern shore, is, you know, we're Catholics, uh, the dream of, of nationhood is not dead. And, you know, it was the center of, um, you know, confederation I think, even though it was a small town, it was the center of uh, the anti-Confederate, I should say, movement in Newfoundland. Uh, St. John's was two to one against Confederation, but in Fairyland it was, you know, way past that. And Major Cashin, who was the leader of the independent forces, came from Cape Royal, which is contiguous with Fairyland on the southeast coast. So he was seen as, you know, the homegrown Parnell-like figure. Uh, whom they were all uh, fervently uh, supporters of. And, um, you know, he, he, he was a very Parnell-like figure because he eventually fell from grace, uh, like Parnell did. Uh, Parnell was the, you know, the leader of, uh, for Irish independence. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, so that's, that's the kind of Catholics they were. Politics was always in it, um, but um, it was also a way of defining yourself in the world, and they were, you know, um, hyper-religious. And yeah. it sounds like that one definable Protestant would have been an interesting person to track down and talk to. I, I would love to have, uh, you know, uh, my question would be why, you know, or, or like, uh, you know, is this a test of some sort or, you know, but yeah, he must have been quite, quite a character. My guest today has been Wayne Johnston. We're going to take a very short break and be right back after this. <laughs> Welcome back to Off the Page. You've been watching us today with my guest, Wayne Johnston. Um, Wayne, you also wrote the screenplay mm -hmm. of the film version of your novel, Divine Ryans. Now, was that like putting the novel through the blender or something, as somebody once described it? It was a bit like that. Luckily, the book had been um, published five years before I actually wrote the screenplay, so I had some distance from it. What I liked about it was that you can collaborate. Uh, with other people, and you're not in that bubble of solitude that a novelist is always in. That's right, and the movie is out, The Divine Ryan, so you can probably find it in a theater near you or on TV, one or the other. Wayne Johnson has been our guest, and you've been watching Off the Page. Thanks a lot for being here. I'll see you again. Mm -hmm.